Bienvenue. Yeah, I'll start. Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to our seminar about Alice's adventures in Wonderland. Sorry. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, so first I'll introduce uh, the three of us, starting with Rens. Um, Rens. 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 Yeah. <laughs> Tell us about yourself. Okay. Nothing there? No? So, um, I'm now doing... Oh, sorry. Everybody can hear me? Yeah? yeah? Okay. So, my name is Rens. Many of you know me as Rens. The last name and the last letter H is the first letter of my, of my last name. If I ever had known I would get so much interaction with Pinside, I think I would have done it a little bit different. Because not everybody calls me Rens. Uh, so, anyway. So, uh, I do this now since I met Barry. Sorry? English or Yinglish? Donglish. <laughs> <laughs> ah, yeah. I'm not used to speaking in to public. So, I met Barry, I think, in 2010, 11, mm -hmm. uh, the Touch Pinball Association. Yes. Uh, we made uh, we make still make a magazine together called Spinner uh, for the Dutch Pimble Association. And 2014, 10 years ago, we visited for the first time uh, Pin Expo, or Pinball Expo, I should say, here in Chicago. That was the moment of the launch of Lebowski. So I put myself then also on the list. I became an early achiever. So that's a long story, of course. <laughs> yeah, short. <laughs> a short introduction. Let's short introduction. <laughs> okay, let's wrap up. Uh, fast forward, uh, since three years, I became more interactive. Uh, this is for me, my wife would call it an out of control hobby. So I have a day job, I do this in the evening and in the weekends I do the, let's say, the web care and the support for Dutch Pinball. That's now since three years. So yeah, that's, that's you want, good. You want okay. the short one? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. Everybody can hear me? Hi, my name is uh, Melville Williams. I'm the uh, lead designer on Alice Adventures in the Wonderland, based off a concept by uh, J-Pop, John Papaduke. Um, I was always a uh, pinball collector, but more from the prototype things. So um, to see all the engineering that went into a game and why it could or couldn't work, um, I took possession of the uh, the lockers of the uh, from J-Pop from the auctions. Um, there was some stuff in there that I found fascinating. So uh, I knew already Barry from some other things. And uh, one day I walked into uh, Dutch and I just said to Barry, like, uh, look, I got this idea. Um, how about we make this game? And he was like, okay, can you do it? I was like, yeah, I think I can. And um, a few weeks later, I showed him my first Whitewood I did on the game. And he was like, okay, you know what? Just let's go for it. Yeah, we'll show that later, so maybe... Yeah. yeah, so now, you know, 10 to 12 months later, we're here. So, uh, it's great. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, we'll talk about that later in detail, yeah. of course. Um, so, we have some topics, a lot of pictures, some videos <laughs> uh, we're going to discuss right now. Um, at last I had a Q&A, but maybe we can do the questions just, you know, as we go. So maybe if you have a question, raise your hand and Jonathan will come to you with the mic and ask, you can ask a question. If that's okay. <laughs> <coughs> so yeah, Melvin was already talking about why Alice, so maybe you can you know, yeah, elaborate a little bit can, more about that. So um, when I acquired the uh, the lockers, you know, most people know about it. If not, so I acquired uh, lockers with uh, uh, from the bankruptcy from John from the Zitaware, and um, so I, I took all the stuff, brought it back to the Netherlands. Um, was digging through all the files and everything he got because his whole life work was in there, and um, there was one game in there that always stood out for me, you know, to give me back that old 90s feeling from, you know, Circus Voltaire and uh, Tales of the Arabian Nights. Um, and the more I dug into it, um, because it was the least developed, it was just a foam core that's everybody familiar with that knows now what Alice is. Um, it just, I just wanted to make that game and see if it was possible to achieve it in a way. Um, 
So we come to the next point. So when I began Alice, there was not much around it. I knew what uh, the art was. And everybody knows like the Disney movies about the uh, about the characters and everything. And some people might know the book. Um, and then when I got there, it's like, okay, what choice do I do now? And because I was looking at the art, and everybody knows that Jeremy Packard did the uh, the translate from it with the with the line art, and um, I had to go off that, you know. So that's where the more adult theme came from, um, because if you, you you know if you talk about Alice, everybody thinks about the you know the Disney movies and stuff. Um, so I just took further steps from that prognosis to go into the game as well. Um, would you have the magic world on a glass? Is that something we want in what yeah, that's way? Yeah, something we wanted to create, of course. So we saw yeah, 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 of course. So when I when I wanted to do Alice, it was like I wanted to try to make that game as close as possible to the foam core, you know. And it was pretty difficult because that's why we still don't have flying cars because everything on paper looks great, but when you gotta create it, you come to something else. So the first Whitewood I build on the lines from John, um, that was a dumpster fire. <laughs> and with all respect to John or whatever he created, it just didn't work out. So I was back to the drawing board, like, okay, I want to get this vision right, but I do not want to change a lot of things because then you're in the debate of, you know, you're changing so much that you cannot do uh, what your uh, vision is. So from that point on, I started to go through iterations of Whitewoods and, and started to see what things I could do to make the game better. So yeah, from the, so from the foam core and all the layouts, I went to the first um, Whitewood and then we put it in like the uh, Fusing 360 just to see, because nowadays I have so much respect for all the, you know, all the guys who made pinball machines back in the 80s, 90s, I can't even imagine how how hard and difficult it was to get things right. Because now these days, I can just look up to like Fusion 360, zoom in and see exactly how much space I got left with with a with a nut and a bolt, you know. And um, so that's that's good. <clears throat> and then, like I say, like creating the prototype that was a uh, that was a thing. So. I had to create first all the lines for all the ball guides to get some good shots in. And once I got that done, then I had to create something that was never finished. So when you look at the foam core, you only see it like this. But if you turn it around, there's nothing there. Um, so there comes the challenge. Okay, what do I have to create to still make it work um, and still have the flow. Um, so eventually, through the time, I, it was a learning curve for me as well, and I just came to a point that it worked. And through different iterations of the Whitewood. Um, and then what also was a problem is, like, everybody knows, like, the Magna Flip on the uh, Twilight Zone. And it's compared to our game, it's a lot smaller. And the only thing you need to do is just a little bit of bashing and just try to get it up, right? Yeah, well, Magnus had a tendency, if you just bash it, it goes like this, you know, like a grabbing effect. So um, that was also pretty difficult to do to also get it working, uh, not only to have it look nice. Then again, when I tried to create this game... Um, I hear a lot of people say to me right now when the games are out there, it's like, but why didn't you do this? Or why didn't you put flippers there? And it's like, that was never, even if, I think if John made this game like 15 or 20 years ago, I think it would be at the exact same, not as beautiful, I believe, with the with the things we put in right now. Uh, but it would be the same game, you know, with the, with the plastic ramps. I, I have people screaming like, why is no wire form in there? Well... That was never in the vision of that game. You know, there's no wireframes in Circus Voltaire. You know, 
Um, so I just try to keep as close as possible to the original design that was there. Yeah. So now we're going to watch some <clears throat> photos of the prototyping process and also. So as everybody know, so this was the um, this is the thing I had to work with. Um, and of course, I had some uh, some some files where he created this foam core from. So I knew a little bit of the uh, base lane uh, layout of the game. Um, so I knew what the vision was from it. And this is where we started from. <clears throat> Here you can see already a little bit further along, we have like... The recycling was made. Yeah, yeah, I know. So this was like a, a later iteration of John's game. And... It's a shame I cannot, can you put it back one more? Uh, I cannot uh, point it out right now. But what John had, he had like a, uh, where I have like, when when people see my game, they see the uh, the clock, you know, the digital one, and you can shoot under, under it. If you see there, John had like, I don't know, a spinning disc or something he had on Magic Girl. But if you look at that shot, there's no way that flipper can take that U-turn right there. There's no way. You only can make that shot if you have a third flipper somewhere uh, where the Newton ball is. Um, so that was a really one thing I was like, okay, that let me first get that right. Oh, here we go. <laughs> nice. Thank so you. if you can see, so this is the spinning disc I was talking about. Um, so if you do this, what you're going to do, you're just going to, there's nothing there. <laughs> So I had to create something to get a little bit more flow into the game. And there what I came up with the whole clock system and with the time. So as you can see, John already wanted like a, a lock system with the three balls. And it's the same as this shot. John was a fan of like having strange stuff. He, I think on the original one I had, he wanted like um, like a spring something like a magic girl and a ball hit it and it just spring it back but it those are things that are nice and that's where we come back to the concept of this is why we don't have flying cars some things just don't work and i i had to find out myself as well and it's the same as the ramp so if you see the ramp right here and you see this hole right there so how would you get up there when the ramp is in the way, you can't get there. So the first white wood I built on his platform with the ramps, I was looking at Barry's like, okay, there's a hole right there. So you shoot through the ramp then? Mm -hmm. That didn't work. So, um, but I also, what I didn't want to do, I don't want to create a ramp that goes outside of the border of the mini play field because then you're losing the illusion of what the concept was. So Barry still hates me for it, but it was like 46 iterations of that ramp just for me to get it working. So I call him in the morning and say, like, yeah, hey, can you change this? Why? It's like one millimeter. Not He's again. Like, Not again. Not again. And again. <laughs> Not again. Because <laughs> one of the guys in the office that does tremendous work on Fusion was one of Barry's staff. So I had to call Barry. It's like Barry said, no, 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 no. If you want something, let me do it because you will make him nuts. And he would just quit his job. And I'm like, okay, fine. We'll do it that way. So uh, for three days, I just put him directly into contact with the engineer. <laughs> he still hates me for it. <laughs> yep. So, yeah. So I had to create something real new and also to be in the lines of the, uh, of the ramp itself. So in the end, I just... Um, as you can see uh, on the game now, it's looked like it's floating. But on the first uh, whitewood I did, uh, it had an extra post right here, right there. Um, but I had to remove it just to make a, a more entry space for the ramp to go around it. But in the end, I was like, oh, that looks more much better because now I have like a floating castle right up there. Um, and also, we changed some things. So John wanted to pop up stuff right here. But I already created these uh, spinning discs that you can use as like a, like a magnet save, but something new. We had it on Magic Girl, but it just didn't work. You know, it, it never grabbed the ball. It was at a too high a location. So I chose to 
not use the pop up because you already have the outline. It's a, it's a save on a save on a save, and I'm like, you know, where's the fun in that? So I just removed it. And we changed some inserts around because I wanted a few more modes. I changed the uh, light the lightning bolts. Um, uh, as you can see here, this lightning bolt right there. I have OCD for uh, straight lines and stuff. So, as you can see, this insert right here on the mini play field, it's a mirrored version of that one, but it doesn't make sense. So, we created a brand new mold just because I wanted the insert to look in the perfect shape. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and so, if we go to the new one, here you can see all the differences from John's to mine. So if you, still the resemblance is the resemblance is still there. So if you can do it a few times, you can really tell that there's much more to it. So like a million things that that you know. Move you will never see it year. until you see it now. There's so many things we we needed to change just to uh, just to get it working. So now so, for some prototyping photos? Yeah, Maybe sure. That? Let yeah. them laugh. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, so this was my uh my first white wood I'd done on uh, John's design. I even hot <laughs> I hot glued the, all the ramps. Um just to see if I could get the flow going. Here you can see it's still the old layout with the old inserts. I uh, added one more. Yeah, it was collect all suits and of course there are four suits, so we change it to. But here, suits, but eventually it changed to to the modes. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. So here you can already can see that that this is not a ball guide, but it's like a, a metal. And when you shoot the U-turn right there, it just hit this. It didn't work. So from this point on, I knew I was in trouble, and uh, had to start over all again. I think it was getting too wet. So here's some things I tried, you know, with ramps going shorters uh, that also didn't work. And this was something that John created right here. And it didn't make any sense because these are light. So these are lights. So you sh this is the inverter goes up and then something happens here. But what happens here then? So those are all things I just didn't know. And I couldn't ask John and I, know I didn't want to. <laughs> So yeah, so here's my uh, mock-up of my uh, first prototype, great ramp, so shot great. So this is ref one. <laughs> <laughs> so here's my um, first concept of, how, okay, so what can I create, you know, to get the ramp up and that sort of stuff. So here is, uh, I think there's a prototype two. Mm -hmm. yep. I still kept the, uh, the inserts right here, but now I already got to see... Uh, I think there's one more in between because this already had the gate up there. Okay. Yeah. We we'll have to check. No, that's that's fine. <laughs> so here you can see. Um, I print. So I printed the first ramp. This one that was the easiest because I just had to get the uh, the lines going and just to see where it gone off. So that was done. Here you can see it's still hot glued, but that worked under this uh, under the uh, under the min. Yeah. So this was already um, the ramp at its final position, and here you can see this is my first idea about the uh, about the clock system um, that I just designed and printed to see if I if it looked good and I can get somewhere. Can you do it one more back? Yeah. So if you can see it's playing here. What I did, I just uh, got Lebowski uh, PCBs and I just hotwired everything to the. Uh, TBL game just to see if I can get it flipping. No. So here we are already in a further stage. Um, as you can see, I already got the uh, the rails right there to, of the plastic. Um, I think it's already got the screen in here. But this was just to see if everything just looked good and worked out. You have more of this? No, no need. <laughs> okay, no, it's fine. Oh, it's easy. Yeah, I think this is already. So these are the final design of the. Uh, so I we we printed these and just glued them together, and they shot great. 
and I now I you can see all the lines. If you look really closely and you look up to the game, this represents like a heart shape. Oh yeah, here was um, the first try I did with the uh, with the lights. Um, I wanted to create a little bit more of a uh, a static to the game, a little bit more of a world on their glass. So I started with these uh, light posts to just place them somewhere. <coughs> oh, it's okay. Yeah, so these are the first my my ideas. I wanted to make. Uh, when I created a game, I wanted to create a world on their glass. And I still believe that's something um, we are missing up to today. Everything is just flat plastic. And I can understand from, you know, um, uh, if, if from commercial um, sites that you want to, you know, you don't want to break things on site or whatever. You want to protect it at all costs. But this was my first idea to get rid of all the plastics. And if you can see here, there's already details in them, but they're not even close to what we put out right now. Um, but this was already my vision, what I was working on to get more sculpts in, um, because I still believe that a pinball machine is not only you know um, fun to play uh, with the family and everybody around you, but I also want to create like an atmosphere, like a good you know like a nice painting at home. It's more than that. These games now all of they all go to you know to your own collection. Maybe one percent of these collector games are out in the wild. They're all in your house. You want you know the best of the best. And I wanted to create something, even if you d don't play it, and you look at all the sculpts. Every time you look at it, you're like, oh, now I see a little bit of that. It's like if you're looking at a painting at home. Every time you look at it, you envision something. And that was my take on to create a world on their glass. Yeah, I think this was the first one. So here you can see the original black and white. So what we've done is the first game we built was the black and white art that everybody knew. Um, but it looks to me, I had some people question me, why would you not leave it black and white? Because it was so, for me, too outdated. You know, I know it was uh, a vision that was done. It was never colorized, but for me, I just... I wanted it colorized. So here, I think this is um, my, f is this the final one I made? This final. The final, final before, yeah. Okay, so this is my um, final whitewood with no art printed on it. But just you can see it already has the four inserts. It already has, here you can see what I, what I created new. So now with the, it's a tight shot, but now with the flippers, you can go here. And then the ball can, if it's a slow ball, it can go into the side of the scoop. Or it can go to this rubber right here. It bounces off this one. And if you're really unlucky, it goes in there. <laughs> uh, but then you got these saves to save that. So it creates a little bit more variety. That's the, that's the only thing I really, really changed to John's game. So as you can see right here... Um, here you can see different spinning discs than the ones I got in there right now. I um, The stranger pattern you create, it doesn't, this pattern did grab the ball, but it just didn't give me that, that grab that I wanted. So when I fine tuned it more and more, it worked. But as you can see here, the um, these are in here. Here's the mini play field with the magna flippers right there. So talking about that mini play field. So if you go, what have you done for Okay, we just pass on. So here you can see the first. Um, this is where we all started. You know, we had the trans light in black and white, and I, um, I wanted to see in color. You know, and that's that was all. You know, all the discussion is about because who chooses that her dress is blue or if it's red, you know, that's always a bit difficult to uh, to get that going. But um, we had a great artist who also did Lebowski and with art direction from me and Barry. You know, I had a vision. I wanted to have bright colors. 
Um, and so we added a few extra things um, that were not in the black and white. Like, you know, you have like a, some moon, star, some more like smoky stuff in the back. And here you can also already see the uh, lit apron for the, um, for the game. So this was almost at a final stage. So now it already had the art on the game itself. And here you can see all the sculpts that we first printed to see um, if, if it would work out. These already had a few iterations as well. Um, and in the, um, on the, so the Jabberwock you see right there that's now in the game, it was initially not there. And I, when I started filling everything in, I was like, hmm, I'm missing something. And that's where we created the Jabberwock character. Oh, yeah. So here's one of the test stuff I did. Uh, as you can see, the awesome ramps right there. <laughs> so I was testing the magnets to see what I can do um, with the game. See if I can backhand shots to uh, to the ramp I made. So with the spinning disc in this one. Yeah, this one's still got the old spinning disc where you can now you can see. So this already had it. So here was like a target. So you should have a flipper right there to get this going. So this that's fine, but it doesn't work. You can never hit this one right there. Yeah, so here was my first try on the uh, on the ramps and on the uh, the spinning discs. That was fun if it worked. So um, yeah, these are the printed ramps. I tried to see if it worked. No breaking shots. <clears throat> the wrench. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, so here at the uh, mini playfield, um, as you can see, there was nothing here. As of that point, um, this is something I added later because I wanted that to create a little bit more um, play in in the game. So if it fires it out, just bounces right here and just creates some more of a uh, of a game play because it's still you know it's still magna flippers. It's not precision flipping, so I needed to get a little more more fun, a little bit more control out of it. So, uh, hold on. Yeah, and here you can see, you see this was the old vision for the inserts. And I didn't like him because it didn't look good. So I created a new mold just to have this one the exact same as that one. So they look in line. And as you can see here, on the games that are now on the shield floor are, there's a rubber right here. It's just that for playing on the show, it's easier to play. But you can remove... Um, the um, the rubber and just do it like this. These are also, you can adjust those for the gap. But if this is too easy for you at the show and you're it, it's in a home environment, you can do a setup like this. And then you gotta catch the ball on the magnet before it drains. Yeah, this is the old ones. Oh, here. <laughs> Nice. Uh, so this is one of my first gates I made to see if I, uh, if it goes off the mini play field. So I printed like a, a ramp, and then it goes back into the uh, into the ramp itself. No, that's yeah. Also with the ugly inserts. <laughs> yeah, here you can see still that ugly insert. <laughs> Oh yeah, you have a wrong order. So here you can see one of the very, very early ones, what John wanted to do. He had it like this, so or the ball went there. But if it didn't, it was just dropping it off just straight into your play field. Um, I know you guys don't like dimples, but I really don't think you want to like this. So this is why I created a whole like a whole cage around it, like you see right here. So the ball wouldn't go into the, uh, look, here you go. Oh, 
Uh, here you can see me testing if it worked with the magnet flipper. So if you can fling this around. Because I wanted to create a little bit more uh, on that play field. Oh, yeah, that's fine. <laughs> so this was my first topper. <laughs> so here was my first idea um, that I wanted a topper with a with a cat. Um, and I already knew what I wanted, you know, to be a little bit more interactive. So here you can see like the first phase when I modeled when we modeled the the cat itself. Um, I was trying out like uh, screens for eyes, but I was missing that depth effect to get that going. So what we use are real glass lenses that make the um, the screens look much bigger. And with the eyes, because they're convex lenses, if you his eyes move, but if you go from left to right, it creates like he's always chasing you no matter what view you have. So here you can see the um, the topper sculpted. And I think it was the old position. It was holding it like this. But if you were looking at the game, you were looking into his paws and it just didn't look right. And this is the final design we have. And my uh, my concept about this is, um, is if people are familiar with the uh, Alice in Wonderland, you also have like the book Through the Looking Glass and Alice walks through the... Um, to the glass, uh, to the mirror itself. So what I wanted to create with the cat, with the uh, with the backdrop right here, is that you know the game itself is the um, is the world, is the, the 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 Wonderland, and I wanted him just to come out of that world and just lure you in. It's like talking, come on, play me, you know, come into this world. It's like he's coming out of that mirror and just trying to lure you in. So I just always wanted to create something like that. Before we go to the art, this is a little impression of all the parts and the final design of the game. Yeah, here you can really see how much goes into it. Yeah, everybody knows it, but... So that's revision 1708. 1708. Yeah, it, yep. <laughs> <laughs> and that's the nice thing about the mini play field. So when I designed um, the game itself, I always also want it to be that it's serviceable. It means that with with a, a few plugs and and you don't have to remove the um, the plastic from the mini play field. It has three screws. You unscrew those and you take out the whole mini play field. And that's like, I think you would time me. You probably can get it out like 30 seconds. And you can get both those ramps out without even removing the little light. Because as you can see right here, the ramps just go through it. So once you got that um, mini play filled out, it's six bolts there, two here, and then four here. And you take out everything. So cleaning up this game is super, super easy. You know, if you need to service something, um, you don't have to take everything apart. I designed it that it's, you know, and all the... So the first time I designed a game, I said to Barry, listen, what's in Lebowski, you know? What is something you can, what's in Lebowski, you can get off the shelf. And he just chucked everything in the box. And er almost from all the mechs that are in there, just I think 90%, you can just, if something goes wrong, go online, you can order. It's all Bally Williams parts, you know, that's what you want. From a surface perspective you don't want special you know of course we have our own board systems um but i didn't want so much special things in there that you were like okay now we gotta deal with the manufacturer and what happens if that manufacturer goes out of business or whatever happens in 10 years you know i wanted that it still is serviceable and it's running on p3 rock those things you can get online as well um so yeah so now we're going to look at some of the artwork that was created for the game. Starting off, you know, we, we started off with the black and white uh, version from Zombie Yeti. So I'm just going to show some iterations. I think it was the first version we got colored by Freek. We also did 
the Lebowski artwork on the play field. <clears throat> yeah, I didn't like the cat right here. Mm -hmm. I didn't like the colors. So um, here you can see a second version. I think, I, mean, I think this was added by me. Put a bit more color to the cat. Yeah, as you can see here, on my prototype, I still have the character right there because this was the original. But I, I just find it odd he was here. So I asked Barry and Frank just to remove this one right here and just put it right there. So you can show her arm much more. As you can see here, I have uh, I have like uh, an OCD. So when you got the translate in the uh, translate in, it wasn't centered with the lock. <laughs> the top of the gate. Yeah. So the top of the gate wasn't centered. I was like Barry, it's not centered. He's like, are you kidding me? It's not centered. So this is why you can see it's moved. Oops. And also you see the character now that has been moved right there. And you can see her. But yeah. So I feel sorry for Barry, but uh. If I wanted something, then uh, so everybody thought that the playfield art was uh like AI and we didn't draw anything. Well, we can tell you that every art that's on the playfield was redrawn. So everything we had some characters, of course, from the uh, from the translate itself. But here you can see all the iterations we went through. And we the, the real the first one, which we didn't like that much, but uh, yeah, I think. Yeah, I think there's 30 versions, so I just skipped going to skip to through them pretty fast. It's just to show you guys that we, you know, we really took the time to really create our own stuff. Don't use AI or whatever. No, it's all hand drawn. First coloring. Put the forest in the bottom. Yeah, Jabberwock layer. We had a lot of discussion about emote inserts. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a lot of versions. Yeah, because I like bright colors. And uh, so we changed up a lot of stuff right here in the inserts. That was the most debate we had about. Because I wanted to create... Um, just, I don't know. I wanted to create like more. Here you can see the stuff that they did. And I told her, I just want more and more color. He's like, how much more? I said, more. <laughs> Give me more. You know, it's. Uh. So here you can see all the steps we went through. And there was another idea with, I think, the queen. Yeah. This with the queen with the inserts. But we didn't like that either. Yeah. So here you can see that we uh, put a large face up. So then nothing. <laughs> Alice. Yep. Nope. <laughs> didn't uh -oh. work. Didn't work. Let's go back ten versions. <laughs> yeah, this is about final, I think. No, no. So yeah, well, yeah, well we're, yeah, almost. Yeah. This is the final version, right? That's coming yeah, up right now. Final. This is final. Yeah. So also mini play field first first sketch. Here you can see, like, uh, I wanted to create, you know, with the Magnus, I wanted that the everything's breaking off with the effects. The, the chair for Queen. <laughs> yeah, so this was a concept, if you get it back right there. And this is what the final... But even on here, you know, I wanted that the inserts are uh, matching colors. I wanted to have text on the inserts and that sort of stuff. So this was the original drawings we had. Uh, so no, yeah, yeah, it was the first sketch. So for the first sketch, yeah. yes. Um, we had some um, line art, of course, for the uh, for the uh, concept game, and this was the first sketches we did on getting it going. Um, Hold on. For the art. Well, I can show. Yeah, well, we we, we saw the, the the 
the first cabinet sketch from uh, yeah so, so it's pretty close if you look at the original sketch from because i know it's debatable right now everybody's like oh you know you over sexualized this game and with the characters on there um but if you really look at it it was already pretty sexualized on the you know the translate was a translate and as soon as you add color to something you create more depth you create something else as well um so yeah um i know john wanted it to be sometimes like a black and white game i just didn't i didn't fit the standard so we just ran with it from the vision we had and just gave our own concept to it so here you can see the uh the back box left side right side with different uh ideas yeah. different ideas so there, wa there was no art for the back box so this is something we completely made new thank you <laughs> yeah, this is how we brief our uh, our artist <laughs> Yeah, so we uh, if we have an artist, then we're just writing down what we want, and then he gives us feedback, and it was like, nope, yep. we want something else. <clears throat> this is the final one, right? Yeah. This so this is the one. the final art for the cabinet itself. You like it? <laughs> so yeah for the design process you know everybody knows we're a very small company i do uh all the design and engineering almost myself barry did all the uh, design work for the pcbs uh we did the art direction ourselves um and to crank out this game of like 10 months for us it was you know a brilliant achievement from going from that phone call to this um and making it DP compatible was was okay because I already started from um, the P3 Rock system and he knew exactly. So when I had my designs finalized, he just made all the new PCBs and all that stuff. So that was good to do. Um, but yeah, working with a small team is really hard, you know. And I sometimes, if you look at the bigger companies. You know, I'm so jealous sometimes that they can walk into another engineer or get some more feedback or, you know, if I'm stuck with something and I can't create it, I cannot call anybody. I just have to go back and back and forth in myself to get it going. And if I find issues, I have to resolve them myself. So that sometimes is uh, a little bit nerve wracking. Yeah. <laughs> to the extent that uh, sometimes we fight. And that's normal. Yeah. <laughs> It's okay. Only here indeed. Oh, yeah. So yeah, because this game was like a, you know, like a '90s game feel. I always wanted to create a. People are saying, "Oh, but you could have done this, or you put this magical mech in there that's not in there." It wasn't the original game. You know, it's if I put something else crazy in there, I could have. But what then? Maybe we're two years out from making this game, and it was never the envision. It was more for me also for myself to challenge me it's like a resume to the world you know let me first do this and then i can take the next step and that's also with the the world under glass i wanted to create something that was never done before um to set the new standard uh and go from there it's also to try to push me as far as i can get myself um and about the rules wise i wanted to go on the easy mode these these days pinball I think it's too complex. Everybody wants more and more and more. I understand it from a perspective, but I have my kids. If they fire up these newest games, they're like, okay, where do I shoot for? Because 20 lights are blinking. I don't know what to do. Give me a book because then I can read on the rules. Um, if you want really, really crazy deep rules with 20 wizard modes, sorry, this game is not for you. And it wasn't designed to be this way because it was designed as it was. And I don't want it to be linear as well, but I want it to be understandable. So where you need to shoot for, that's the thing that's blinking. 
and not to anything else because you just lose track. Um, there are tight shots in there. Uh, the wizard mode is reachable. And for the, ex you know, for the experienced player, there's also something in there. And we're thinking about that too. Um, I try to just create the best of both worlds. And I don't think you need to see this game as the next Godzilla, X-Men, or whatever. This is just, for me, uh, a passion of love, you know, to get this game out with all the rule sets. With, with the tools I have into this game, I try to create the best I can and give you the back that 90s feeling with the rule set. Well, I think that was, <clears throat> that was about it, about the game. So we just want to show some, some work and, and sketches on the animations. So we just started off with some animatics, black and white, and then after that we uh, we colorized them. So it's also all ha mostly hand drawn, then animated in After Effects and colorized with some 3D effects. Just to so this is a mode where you have a, an intro, a running loop, a hit. And an ending. So when when it's done colorized, it looks like this. It all looks very simple, but I think we have more like al already 200 animation or something in a game. So it's uh, <laughs> a lot of work. <laughs> Caterpillar, one T. <laughs> on the first prototype, we had Caterpillar with two T's. Yeah. <laughs> Misspelling on the play field. Caterpillar. <laughs> so all the animation also hand-drawn and then, you know, animated in elements and in After Effects. <laughs> no. <laughs> yep. If I'm correct, I think the prototype had the screen under the glass. I'm glad it doesn't. Like, what drove you to make that decision to put it back up in the back box? You couldn't see anything. <laughs> yeah. Basically. So, um, on that, I had the old cabinets. Uh, I have them. And on John's game, he had the the mini playfield so low that you can never ever see under it. So if even on John's game, it could never work because he, if he had lifted up that mini play field, it would block the whole screen. You know, it, it just wasn't also working on that cabinet because I own a magic girl. You cannot even read. It's nice to have that novelty cabinets and stuff, but there's a reason everybody loves the Bally Williams and all these types of don't change too much, even though it looks magical. It just doesn't work. It just doesn't. <laughs> I guess we only have five minutes left. Uh, the the title of your of this talk is I mean I, this is fascinating. I love this game, but the title of the talk is where you guys are and where you're going. What can you tell us about where you're going? Well, right now, of course, we have to to focus on uh, on Alice and getting it in production. So that's our main focus right now. Planning on Sonic production beginning of the year, January February, and then of course with our you know we build about ten games uh, a week. So we're probably, you know, pretty much done for 2025. So that's main focus right now. Yeah, and so uh, all I can say is that I push myself hard to to make something new um, with the sculpting and, and the word on the glass. All I can say is that on the next game we're trying to push out, I will uh, challenge myself to go even further. So. All you expectations, what you have right now on this game, I will do my best to uh, top it twice. <laughs> Question is, did you create your own font? 
for no that. it's an existing font but we made it you know it's uh, in in a 3d animating program we made them 3d with some, some special textures on it yeah I just want to say congratulations. I think you made an amazing game, and uh, I bought one. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Thank you. <laughs> My biggest question is I think it's very unique and amazing, and um, will you ever remake the game, or will you protect the people that – Sorry? You? Will you ever remake the game? Remake? Yeah, like will you rerun it someday, you think? No, never. No. This is where DPX stands for. We think exclusive is exclusive. If you buy from us, we guarantee you we will never rerun, do anything else. That's the game you're getting. Thank you. I think you have an amazing company. We're very, very happy. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. It's good. All right. Yeah, thanks. Donuts on.